Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. Father Haggerty is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York who serves at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He taught moral theology and worked as a spiritual director in seminaries for 20 years. He has directed numerous yearly retreats for the missionaries of charity. He is the author of Contemplative Provocations, The Contemplative Hunger, Conversion, Contemplative Enigmas, and St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, the book on which this series is based. St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We look at, even in the very early church, St. Paul had to send a corrective, as it were, to the Corinthians. And we see that passage so beautifully in chapter 13, where he he talks about you can have all these types of gifts, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. It's all, you know, you're clanging gong, a clashing cymbal. If you don't have love, and that is the, the, the great charity, the great the care for the other, if it doesn't manifest, then it's nothing. And do you think that's where John of the Cross is going with a, some of this teaching? Well, this is, you know, exactly. And that's why he has, you know, great stress on the, the will and, you know, what we're doing with our will before God. You know, and sometimes he's thought of as a, you know, something of a severe teacher, but his teaching on asceticism is not to you know, do excessive practices, harsh ascetical practices, but rather to live in a very um, serious way with our, with our will. In fact, he has a, a statement at one point that spiritual union exists, you know, spiritual union meaning really real holiness and sanctity. Spiritual union exists when God's will and the human will are in conformity. It's a word that he and St. Teresa of Avila like, the will in conformity with God's will, so that nothing in the one is repugnant to the other. So it doesn't speak of, you know, extraordinary experience, but rather, you know, this surrender, you know, of our will, our life, generously to God. And that's always going to mean an active approach you know, to what we're doing in our, in our lives. An example, you know, St. Therese of Lisieux, yes, living in the quiet of a cloister, but apparently from her teaching and from her, the description of her life, you know, very active in her attentiveness, you know, to these small things that can be done in love, sometimes, you know, in mental austerity, you know, turning away from judgments or, small acts of appreciation, her smiles, you know, these things are what do lead to the, the greater union with God in, of a will and united to God and God's will in, in supernatural charity. So these are the real realities of spiritual life. And it's why, you know, it's very encouraging in a way too, to realize that because, you know, we don't have to have extraordinary things with God, but we do want a deeper contemplative, you know, deeper, we want depth in our spiritual life. And depth comes about too when, yes, there's more attention to the smaller moments of our day and, you know, what we can give to God and to please him in these small things. And that just leads then to a deeper sensitivity toward God when we do go to prayer in any kind of silence or when we're at mass or, you know, have some quiet moments with God. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it, when you look at the lives of uh, certain saints. St. Faustina comes to my mind where here she has had an experience from the Lord. He's, He's telling her that she is going to have to leave and found an order but she does not receive the permission to do that. And that obedience primarily to the authority over her 
is something that is actually turns out to be a great gift. Maybe that's not a, a great example. Maybe it is, but it's one of those where we think the Lord is telling us to do certain thing, and that it's absolutely going to happen, and yet God uses it in the great mystery. Something greater is made manifest. And John of the Cross writes about something similar to that, does he not? You know, that's a very, uh, you know, real reality that, you know, we might, you know, receive something from God and then it actually means something different. I mean, he does have a passage where a person may sense that God has said to them, you're going to be a martyr one day. And maybe not in you know such explicit words, but that sense that deep down I'm going to I'm going to um, suffer martyrdom, and the person doesn't end up dying you know as a red blood martyr, but God fulfills that prayer in a different way, and He allows you know perhaps a, a different type of martyrdom you know to go to take place perhaps in. Uh, you know, difficulties in in, uh, receiving humiliations, let's say, from others. And so God has his own way sometimes. He's speaking truthfully maybe to a soul if there is such a strong inspiration, but it's not always fulfilled in the same manner. You know, it's possible like with the St. St. Faustina, I'm I'm not so sure there, but it could be that God did fulfill that in a different way, you know, as in after her death in the the spread of the divine mercy teaching after her death. I mean, it, it reminds me, as you're speaking of that, you know, Jesus' words to St. Peter when he was going to wash his feet, and Peter questioned him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And all Lord's words, you know, you do not know now what I am doing. Later you will understand. And sometimes that really means also perhaps you don't know now what I'm saying, Later, you'll understand what was meant. And that could be a time. So it's not good to, you know, latch on sometimes too quickly to things. On the other hand, I, 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 I'm a little bit uh, unsure of, I don't want to confuse people who might be listening also, because, you know, let's say two young people are, you know, considering getting married, you know, two good, good Catholics, and they sense strongly, God wants me to marry this person. And, you know, she loves him, he loves her. You don't need a, a sign from God in any special way, and we shouldn't assume that that's not from God. You know, people are being led also in, in what you would call normal, you know, human ways, in deep spiritual ways, and God is speaking in a kind of you know, the beauty of his mystery in those things. So it's not as though we need to, you know, contradict all that. It's, uh, it's more very, you know, if we're thinking extraordinary things have just been spoken to me, then, you know, maybe some caution and care. And John of the Cross is addressing perhaps that section in the ascent of Mount Carmel because he was writing to Carmelites who were living in solitude and, in this solitary quiet of that type of life, it's possible that, you know, some people might have had mystical aspirations in their life. And that needs surely to be tempered, you know, in most cases. Well, I think that's why the the importance of your book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, because the reality is there's a lot of lay people now who have access to his work, where he might have been writing to a particular community or an individual, now there are so many others, hundreds of thousands, if not more than that, to experience what he writes, what Teresa of Avila writes, and yet they do not have the opportunity for maybe spiritual direction. They desire to have this contemplative response to God, to be able to to listen deeply. There are those experiences in prayer that may not necessarily be from God, and it can be very confusing. They've gone to different communities, and I'm not saying it's all. I I say it very reverently because I believe people have a, a holy intention of heart, but they may be caught up in a group experiences that 
are not necessarily exhibiting prudence or a type of humility when receiving those things, and they get very caught up in it, that may be more of a euphoria as opposed to something that is truly from God. And I think that's why this has to kind of help the souls out there to be able to rest in what they're receiving in prayer. Does that make sense, Father Haggerty? It makes sense. Um, It's not my experience so much, but I think, you know, what you may be speaking of, you know, accurately is, uh, you know, John of the Cross is a, uh, I don't think he's really optional in spirituality. I think that he's, he is speaking of the very genuine, authentic path to God And it's possible to choose sometimes other approaches to spirituality that may not have this kind of depth. And it doesn't mean they're they're wrong or uh, that they're not good. But as an example, and, you know, I, I, I am speaking really as somebody who doesn't have much knowledge of it, but there could be, um, there could be a kind of tension or even a contradiction between what St. John of the Cross is teaching and experiences, let's say, of those who enjoy the charismatic type prayer or charismatic gatherings. And they can be, you know, I I assume, you know, very consoling, very much a sense of all Lord present because of the music and the candlelit chapels or churches and and they are they are great experiences and very good for young people perhaps who are just getting started, you know, in their faith or coming back to the faith. They can be good experiences to you know get a flame lit for people. But I think over the long term, you know, the reality is that the desert is part of spiritual life, and it's part of life, and it doesn't mean it's the only reality there. But there is a purifying experience as we approach, you know, more depth in in spiritual life. And, you know, the chase after good experiences would be like in marriage. I mean, I think there's a lot of parallels in marriage. I'm not married. I'm a priest. Mm -hmm. But the reality of marriage, you know, there there are great, beautiful things, you know, before you get married, the early years of marriage. But the real test of marriage is you know, that you grow in love day in and day out over these many years together, which has times of trial, difficulties perhaps with children, and staying close together when there's desert time. And and to me, that's the real reality also of spiritual life. It's true in the priesthood also. And, and the charismatic or uplifted experience, if that becomes the the climactic experiences of God, and we wait for those things or live for those things, and yes, live a good life also with that. But I'm not sure that those are, I don't think they have the depth that uh, that deeper walk in contemplative prayer. I'm sure they don't. It doesn't. It's not the same reality as the receptive permission that we have to give to God to do whatever he likes, including in our interior life. As Mother Teresa said, you know, give God permission. That sounds maybe like a you know an easy you know statement, but to give God permission to do what He wants, to be as withdrawn as He wants at times, to you know keep us waiting at times, and to leave us empty, you know, for His greater purposes. You know, it comes down to what the Gospel says many times that you know when Jesus is basically teaching us. Lose yourself, and then you will gain, you know, this true self, you know, united with God. I'm so glad you put it that way, because just my experience over many decades now, I'm not trying to take a brush and sweep it over all of the charismatic experiences, but I have witnessed where in some of these communities, there is such a fervor, almost it's like a wave. They go way up and then they crash down because of some of the traps, as John of the Cross will outline in the uh, Ascent to Mount Carmel in that, in that book too, that 
the subtleness of the pride, the um, the retaining and not moving in a continuous, you know, to that that deeper response in love, that conversion to be able to reach out to others in their suffering. And that, it can cause a, a lot of trouble in the community. I keep going back to that that passage in Corinthians 13. But you can also see that in Matthew chapter 25, where he said, well, a lot of people will say, Lord, Lord, but I won't know them because they, they were not, you know, feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, helping the poor, visiting the imprisoned and welcoming the stranger. It seems, Father, that if we get stuck in just the experiences, the conversion, the deepening, turning to Christ, we get stuck, and it's difficult to love in that deeper way he's asking us to. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense, but I, I can't speak for other people. It might be that a person who does um, participate in charismatic prayer, mm-hmm. maybe on a regular basis, you know, is... Uh, enlivened by that and goes out, you know, and does very good, you know, work. And I, I would assume they do that and finds this a benefit to their spiritual life. But I, I think to go back to the point that I know it's a good examination for all of us regularly in some manner that we that we're just careful with God that we're, as you said earlier, that we're not seeking after the gift, that we're not, you know, really looking for the experience rather than God himself. And we should expect that God, if it's the real God we're, you know, chasing after, that he is confronting us at times with with challenging things, that he wants us to stretch. He wants us to go beyond what we have been doing. You know, that he definitely wants more attention to the poor in our lives and not just Maybe the poor people, and if we live in a city that are homeless on the street, but, you know, just a greater sensitivity to poor people, the person alone, you know, solitary, you know, the person in our own family who may, you know, be the poorest of the poor. And, you know, as the gospel says, as spirituality says, you will know them by their fruits. Well, this is true of of all of us in our prayer. You know, it's it's what we do outside of prayer that shows whether that prayer is really, you know, has, has depth to it. And that's why if we do come out of prayer wanting God, that implies I, I want to please him. I want to give delight to him. I want to do things in which I can be used for his purposes. And I want to, I want to be generous you know, with him as he's been so generous to me. And this kind of um, aspiration is a good sign in prayer. I think people who are serious about prayer, we always have to be careful, too, that that solitary practice of prayer is not a practice in self-absorption. So, you know, the charismatic might say to the, you know, the person who is trying to grow in a contemplative grace, you know, be careful yourself there that, you know, you're not getting absorbed in just seeking interior experiences with God in some manner that you're in in your own chase after something that is less than God himself. And yes, John of the Cross is is addressing that too. What would you say to that person that may read John of the Cross and this caution about what we hear or receive or what we think we're receiving in our prayer, it causes them alarm because— they want to seek God's counsel, like you said, whether it's to marry a particular person or to take a job or what should I be doing today? Is John of the Cross saying to me, I shouldn't listen to what I feel God's saying to me in prayer? It, I think it can be a little confusing for them. Well, I think we have to expect that, you know, graces are leading us and we're not getting mystical, extraordinary messages from God, but that he is, you know, drawing us to what he wants. And, you know, it's in God's interest to, in some manner, open us to, to what, what he wants, what his will is. But I don't think it's good to, uh, to expect, you know, telegram type of, uh, you know, identification of what, what God wants in our life. 
that we we pray and put it in God's hands. And sometimes we have to take take our best choice, what we think God wants. And you know, sometimes there is is very great variations in that. You know, getting married is a huge you know step in one's life. So to really pray and there's nothing magical that should be expected there. You know, we we have to say, you know, deep down sense, you know, that God wants this. I remember in the in the documentary, one of the documentaries on Mother Teresa, she's being interviewed and she's asked, you know, this is mother, this is a very difficult life and you know, much hardship in it, so sacrificial that these young sisters, you know, enter into this kind of life and Does it surprise you, mother, that, you know, so many of these young sisters, these young women come into this life, sometimes from good, you know, backgrounds and and to work with the poor in this manner? And how do they know, mother, how do they know this, that this is what God wants? That's the question. How do they know that God wants this? And Mother Teresa's response was, they know. Deep down in their hearts, they know that this is what God wants in their life. And they have had the courage to go forward to it. Now, that's just saying, you know, there's a kind of deep instinct, you know, within us, you know, to major things like that going into a life. But we also have that deep instinct. This is what God wants. When there are good things, you know, being posed before us as possibilities, You know, it could be small things. We're walking down the street and we sense that, no, God wants me to give something to this this man here or this woman here. You know, to be alert to sensitive, to ways to please God. You can assume that God is very happy when we're taking the the moment to please him. We don't have to have a, a message from God, you know, saying, no, do this in that moment, but that desire to please him. And that's, you know, a safe, holy way to live a life. Yeah, I think that's what's so beautiful about having that sacramental life, that just that steeping in a continual encounter of grace, His grace, divine life, the pondering of sacred scripture. Again, and and frequently the opportunities for confession, uh, the sacrament, to be able to continually examine. It's just the living that life of in response to the call of holiness, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, very personal relations with our Lord is is important. And, you know, without making them into mystical type things, but to be very personal and to realize how personal is his gaze on our own life. And, you know, and, and that's why praying in before the Blessed Sacrament, you know, going to Mass every day, but praying before a tabernacle or a monstrance is a very great aid, you know, surely for prayer, because he's personally there. He's very real, and he really does have eyes of infinite love, you know, gazing on our own life. If we can come out of prayer in that manner, you know, with a desire to please him, you know, Jesus' words in John's eighth chapter, you know, speaking of his father, he, he never leaves me alone because I do always what pleases him. You know, and this intention, this desire to please him in what we do, you know, that's a great way to live, whether you're in a cloistered convent or raising a young family, married, if you're a priest, you know, and we can have that, that sense, you know, many times in the day to do what pleases him. Yeah, and I think there's, in a very practical way, too, for some souls, I know I need to do this, that sometimes when I'm I'm praying and I feel there's the more, that just a, a little more in this prayer, I need to write it down. I need to journal. And then I can even let that go once I put that down. And if necessary, I share this with a good spiritual counselor or a director or my spouse to be able just to, even if you have to, just write it down and then let it go and see what the Lord's doing with all that. That sounds good. Um, I know that I have um, been asked sometimes, you know, as a priest about, you know, journaling. And I often say to people, 
it's good to write down, you know, when we sense some insight, you know, if I see mm-hmm. something that never caught me before in reading the gospel, or perhaps in a line from the Psalms or from St. Paul. So when we see something and we have an intuitive, you know, thought or insight that we had, had not, not occurred to us before, that's good to write down. Mm-hmm. What I don't think is so good in, in, in journaling is to write down, you know, to recap, you know, what were my feelings in this time of prayer, Mm -hmm. how close I felt to our Lord, or, um, you know, to kind of take our temperature on the state of our prayer on that day. I'm not sure that's so good, because Mm -hmm. I think you said it, you know, at the end just there, you know, it's better to we pray and you and you leave it because we also will be back the next day. And prayer, you know, is an ongoing thing that we don't really need a diary of our prayer, but it is good to to write down insights because they they can be, you know, surely, surely graced uh, receptions from God. He's allowing us to see something, hear something differently that we didn't catch before. And those things are, are, are good. But if it's if it's about ourself and our own experience there, that can sometimes, um, that could uh, encourage, you know, the experience-seeking type of prayer. And, you know, we think, oh, that prayer was not as good as yesterday because I don't feel as good. It's better just live through it and then we move on to the next next day. That's exactly what I was talking about because it, you have to be very careful because then the focus is on me again. Mm-hmm. Prayer sometimes I think can get confused. I'm going to have to be very careful how I say this, but it can be c- confused with uh, psychological sessions. You know, there's a difference between the focus is all on me and instead of the focus is just being open to him and my love for him and my praise and my worship for God and taking, setting time to, to rest with him like Mary, Bethany. I know I can, the tendency to fall back into, well, this is all about me and I want to feel better. And th- there's a balance. I'm trying to be real sensitive about that. There's a balance there, isn't there, Father? Well, no, you, ha- you say it very well, Chris, because um, I think we all have, naturally, it's like eating. I'd rather eat you know, more tasty food than something that is very bland and our interior life has much the same response. It's, I would rather have a time of prayer where I really feel and sense the closeness of our Lord than something much more, you know, dry and uh, empty. But I, I do think it's, um, it, it's true for, for, I assume everyone that we need some support too from scripture. And that's helpful, especially in the beginning when we're beginning prayer in silence, it's good to have some initial um, help for our mind in prayer. And with scripture is the best thing. We need something like a bridge that is going to be that we can walk across into this presence of our Lord, some means of contact with him. And surely the words of Jesus in, in the gospels are very helpful for that. We don't have to do a big meditation but the effort to be in his real presence, the mind, if it's blank, simply may go then looking after simply feel, feelings in prayer that we want to feel our love for our Lord or our emotional um, you know, desire for him. And I think it's good to have something for the mind to initially uh, get caught by and we don't always find that, you know, perhaps, but the gospel is full of things that can initially get us going and begin to walk across that bridge. And then maybe our Lord is walking um, from the other side across to us through those words. Oh, I like that. That's really nice. That's a, a great way to meet him. Oh, Father Haggerty, I wish we had more time, but any final thoughts in reflecting on what we've had in our conversation today? Well, Chris, I, I, again, I appreciate you giving uh, this time for these, uh, these, these exchanges. But I, I think my, my, my one thing would, I would say is, 
you know, prayer is a great perseverance. And, it, and this is why perhaps John of the Cross used the image of the, the ascent of Mount Carmel. It's an ascent, you know, where God is holding his hand out to us to help us climb this mountain. But a perseverance, you know, through the winter seasons of prayer, the spring, the summer, the fall, that prayer has its seasons, you know, sometimes within even one week and certainly within a month. And and to persevere through all things. And the goal is this desire for Jesus Christ crucified, you know, as the beloved of our lives and a great desire to, to seek him through all things. You know, prayer is for the sake of love. And we want to live a life really animated by love, you know, more and more deeply in our lives. This is the whole point of taking prayer seriously. Father, thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. You've been listening to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty. This series is based on the book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, published by Ignatius Press. Visit Ignatius.com to obtain a copy, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty.